Decay and Prevention Methods. I'm Rachel Harmon, and it's for Eastern Washington's Dental Hygiene Program. I'm in the Degree Completion Program. So right now I'm currently a dental hygienist and a certified dental assistant, but I actually hold two associate's degrees. One's an AA I got from South Seattle, and one is an AAST, which is the dental hygiene one, which allows me to practice dental hygiene. Of course, you also need to pass board exams to do that, but moving on. Our learning objectives for this presentation is that at the end of it, you'll better be able to discuss dental decay with your patients or people you love or care about. And you'll be able to define and identify the term dental decay. You'll be able to describe the process of dental decay a little bit better, and you'll learn at least three methods of prevention. On Tuesday, when I was here and we handed out the pre-quizzes, I gave you the list of dental clinics. On the last page of the bottom of that list, there's a little note for you guys. So some of these affordable clinics, they will get somebody on the phone and then will say, OK, we're not accepting new patients. And they think, OK, well, I've never been there before, so that qualifies me as a new patient. But if they're in pain, they're now qualified as an emergency patient. They are not a new patient. So you'll get somebody who's a receptionist sometimes who will say, oh, we're not taking new patients. We can't see you. Well, actually, no, they have to see them if they're in pain. So it's important for you guys to note that when you send somebody someplace to make sure that they're clear on their stating they're coming in as an emergency because they're in pain. They need an x-ray of that area, and let's move on. So we'll also describe signs and symptoms and identify symptoms. So we just kind of did that. So moving on. And now we're introducing dental decay to you. It is the most prevalent disease in the United States for adults and children. It is preventable, and it is responsible for the most missed number of school days per year. So it's quite an impressive number, but I would have you take note to this number, as you might see it later. <laughs> And moving on, it's um, a preventable disease, but mainly it first starts affecting the enamel. We're just going to kind of briefly go over some terminology. You're probably already familiar with this terminology. Um, when you go into chemistry, if you do, enamel will be called hydroxyapatite. Dentin is hydroxyapatite. Enamel is the hardest uh, structure in the body. Dentin is also pretty hard, but it's not as hard as enamel. It's softer, but it's harder than bone, and it has nerve endings. And sometimes when the decay is in the dentin, people will feel pain, but not always. And then if you're working with a dentist, which you will be, hopefully, and you're watching them take out decay, do a filling, they will sometimes hit blood. You'll see blood. You're like, oh, blood. Yeah, well, then we just hit the pulp. The pulp is full of blood and nerves, and then you'll know that you're going to be there a little while longer because you're going to do a root canal. <laughs> and that is to remove the nerve, which extends into the bone. And moving on to the next slide, the periodontium is four structures. It's the bone, the PDL or periodontal ligament, the cementum, and the gingiva. The root of the tooth is covered by cementum. It's highly sensitive when it's exposed because of recession. So sometimes if people are complaining of sweet sensitivity, it might be because this is exposed. And then surrounding that is a periodontal ligament. This attaches the tooth to the gingiva, and it's all supported in the bone. And I like to actually give the analogy to my patients that, you know, people think the teeth are really important, which they are. They help us chew, but we can't have teeth if we don't have the surrounding structure to support these teeth. So I tell the, te uh, the patients that your teeth are a lot like diamonds. They're these beautiful, shiny things. But if you want to wear a diamond, you have to have metal for that ring. Let's say you want a diamond ring, right? You want to wear this diamond. The metal is more like the bone. It's what gives support so you can wear this diamond. But then, you know those little prongs that hold the diamond in? Those are more like the gums that are holding the diamond in. But you cannot have teeth if you don't have good bone. So moving on. And what is dental decay? Dental decay is an infection. It spreads. It could be transferred from people. And it likes to start with the bacteria attaching to the tooth, either through dental plaque or tartar, which is also known as calculus. It's a professional term. We're not talking about math. <laughs> 
some people, like your patients, might get confused if you say, oh, they have a lot of calculus. Oh, they have a lot of math now. <laughs> they have a lot of tartar. So the bacteria like to feed off whatever it is we eat. It's really gross to think about, but the bacteria are creating waste products because they are constantly pooping in your mouth, and that is what we call acidic byproducts. And that's what the teeth uh, makes them weak and starts breaking them down. Okay, so if we let the bacteria just overtake everything, we're gonna get an unhealthy balance of oral microflora. And this is what causes decay. So if saliva isn't enough, if um, fluorides and calcium phosphates aren't enough to be able to help the tooth, then the tooth will start breaking down first with a carious lesion, and then those will turn into cavities. Yeah. Okay, next slide. So where can dental decay be found? I heard you guys have started learning some classifications of some things. Um, I don't think you're familiar yet with GV Black's classifications for restorations, but where, um, and you'll learn this later, you don't have to know it, it's just good to get you familiar. Um, where we're gonna find cavities is either on the biting surfaces, those are called class one, or on the occlusal surfaces, in between the teeth, those are gonna be class two for back teeth and class three and four for front teeth. Um, at the gum line is a class five, and then on the cusp tip is a class six. We could also get root caries. This really affects older people, people who are on medications or just have problems with dry mouth for um, various reasons. And if it's left untreated because decay does spread this can be a fatal situation. Um, it's rare nowadays, but you know we've learned the hard way. Um, they had found the DNA of King Tut. They had his DNA, and when they were able to find his granddaughter and verify that this was his granddaughter through DNA testing, they discovered there was this uh, little jar that had been put with her mummy. And it's very interesting because when they discovered this, they thought, oh, we want to open it up and see what's in there. But they thought, oh, if we open it up because it's so old, it might just crumble. So what they did was they scanned it. And they realized there is a tooth inside there. And then when they started looking at the mummy, they discovered that she actually still had some fragments of a tooth that they tried to extract. So it's interesting because some uh, historians will say that Egyptians did not attempt oral surgery, but they did. They did attempt oral surgery. But they also uh, killed this lady who was not only a queen, but she was a pharaoh. She was maybe one of the only women, I think, in Egyptian history who held uh, the position of pharaoh. So she uh, had an abscess. They tried to take out the tooth. But what happened was that infection went straight into her bloodstream, and that is how she died. Yeah. Moving on. So this is the classification of GV black. Uh, this is class one, could be on an anterior tooth or a posterior tooth in the center of the tooth. This is a class tooth, posterior tooth on the side of the tooth. Class three, again, side of the tooth, but anterior tooth. Class four includes the incisal edge. Class five could be posterior or anterior. It's always at the gum line. And class six, you really probably never really hear about going through school, but it does exist on the cusp tip. And moving on. Oh, he's also known as the father of modern dentistry, if we didn't say that one. <laughs> So caries versus cavities. Is a cavity the same as caries? No, they're not exactly the same because you could have a cavity without having caries because a cavity is just technically a hole. So sometimes somebody's uh, filling or sealant could pop out and so you have a little cavity that needs to be filled but it doesn't necessarily mean it was caused by caries. But caries can lead to cavities, yes, or dental decay which causes the cavity. But caries is reversible while decay is not. So caries will usually start, caries lesions will start these little small things and doctors will usually say, oh, we're gonna just keep our eye on this area for right now. So sometimes if we could get the patient doing really good home care uh, using fluorides, that could actually reverse, but decay is to the point where it needs to be treated, otherwise it will continue spreading. Yeah. 
Okay, so moving on. How does decay spread? Decay spreads just the same as in an apple. It starts small, it gets deeper, it gets bigger, and it will keep going uh, just like how it spoils the whole apple. If we allow it, it could go on to other structures of the body. It could affect the blood, the heart, the head, the neck. And if left untreated again, it could be fatal. Moving on. Okay, so causes of dental decay. It is now the belief that only a few specific bacteria actually cause dental decay. And if this bacteria is never introduced to a child, they have the opportunity to never have dental decay. So um, the bacteria that's mainly number one thought to be responsible for decay in the enamel is Streptococcus mutans. It's called mutants because when they first saw it in a microscope, they thought it looked alien to them. So that's how that got that's name. The lactobacillus species acts more in the dentin or in the cementum. And there's a couple other uh, bacteria they think are responsible for decay in the cementum, which is root caries, which makes those a little bit more susceptible for people who are older, geriatric, or have recession or exposed roots. On. Contributing factors are genetics. Uh, some people I've seen, they'll come in, husband and wife, husband never brushes, never flosses, look at his teeth, amazing, no cavities, looks good, gum tissue looks good, how does this happen? I explain genetics. Wife will come in, she's always brushing, always flossing, cares about her teeth, wishes they were like her husband. <laughs> hates him because he just has the lucky genetics while she gets cavities all the time. <laughs> it happens. People with autoimmune diseases, um, uh, Crohn's disease. I knew a girl who had Crohn's disease, had horrible, horrible teeth. It was, it was related to this. And ability of minerals to remineralize. That is very important. Sometimes people just say, my teeth just feel soft, they feel weak you know, even with fluoride. And then frequency of personal care, professional care, and quality of care. This is where you guys come in. You want to make sure you give patients quality care. You want to be compassionate, number one. Number one, always listen to what their main complaint is. If you ignore that main complaint, then we're defeating the purpose of trying to help them, which most of the time, the first question I ask anybody, are you in pain? Or are you having any sensitivity that you're concerned about? Number one question. Next thing I ask, are you on any medications? Do you have any allergies? Have you had any hospitalizations in the past three to five years? Or just recently since your last visit? All those are good questions to know. You can never go wrong asking those things. OK, go ahead and go on. And if they do have pain, we ask them a couple more things after that. So other increased risk factors, young enamel more susceptible, deep pits and fissures. This is why we do sealants. Lots of visible plaque that could put, or tartar that could put people at risk. Appliances, retainers, mouth guards, those need to be cleaned properly. Frequent snacking, acidic beverages or foods. Depression, people stop brushing their teeth. If they have eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia is really bad. Medications, dry mouth, acid reflux, and then of course periodontal disease and gingivitis. This is what we were talking about. This is why we did this on the board. So if we look at what we did, the signs, we basically have this. We have inflammation. We have swelling. Falls in line pretty much with abscess, which is pussy. We have pus up here. And black holes, yes, those are definitely something we could see. So then symptoms, what we could feel, sensitive, bad taste, like your blood, definitely. How does it taste? Is it smell? Oh, I guess that's a sign. So that's something we can see. I think, can you see taste, smell taste? I think that would be more of a symptom. But they have it down as a sign here. So I think it's because, you know what, when I'm working on patients and I have a mask on and I could smell that like periodontal disease smell, I think that's why we're calling that a sign. That's horrible when you have a patient like that. You have a mask on and you could still smell all of that. 
But that's why we have a mask. And let's see, hard. So I think, yeah, if you have a patient and they're talking about they're feeling pain, you want to ask them what type of pain or what's causing the pain. There's four things that mainly cause pain. It is heat, cold, sweet, and biting. Patients need to bite or can't bite, like how I had happen to me. So also, are they sensitive all over, or is it just in one area? If they're saying, yes, this one area, it's uh, very painful to bite, it feels swollen, you want to get one x-ray, one PA of this area that they're complaining about. Even if you do not know what is wrong, you give that x-ray to your doctor, and your doctor is going to love you. Because I remember one time I had a patient. I didn't know it was wrong, and I worked at this place where um, a lot of people there spoke Russian or Spanish. Very few Americans. And he comes in. He's older. He's Russian. Doesn't know any English. I barely know. I only know six words, and it's if I practice them <laughs> in Russian. So he's pointing here. I'm understanding he's in pain. I get an x-ray of the area. But the doctor, when he comes in, I had measured around the tooth with a periodontal probe, and some of my measurements were not correct, OK? I made one mistake with not getting the correct measurement. But what I did do is I got that x-ray. So he could see exactly what was the problem with that x-ray. But also that day, time was rushed. And so I had to put the patient into an emergency room. I told the doctor when he got there, because I was already working before the doctor got there, we have a patient in the emergency room. We took x-ray. Here's the measurements. He's like, later came back. These measurements are wrong, but the x-ray was good. He saw exactly what he needed to do. The guy lost his tooth that day. It was very abscess, but at least he got help. At least he told us what the main problem was when he first got there. I have pain here. They will point here. You want the x-ray where they point. <laughs> OK, so moving on. Sometimes you don't see any signs or symptoms. Sometimes there is decay there, and you will only find it by taking an x-ray. You will sometimes see it in the x-ray, and that is the only way you'll know that there is a problem. They won't complain of anything. They won't know that there's a problem always. I had a patient here when I was in hygiene school. It was really sad. He was DSHS. We discovered all these cavities in our proximal. We could have treated him, could have taken care of everything. But he did not believe us, even after we showed him the x-rays, that there were cavities. And the way that DSHS was set up, if he didn't get them filled as cavities, what they do is they don't save teeth. They do not do crowns or root canals the majority of the time, only in some cases. Like the clinic on the resource list over in Kent, I heard they do root canals. Sometimes I heard Renton will do root canals. Rarely do they do root canals or crowns in a DSHS setting, which is Department of uh, Social Health and Public Services, or is Department of Social Health Services. Anyway, so he didn't believe us. He didn't know. He didn't have any pain. They were into the dentin, and he decided not to get any treatment. Could it happen, regardless of how much you try to educate your patients on what we're seeing? So different types of decay could affect uh, all different kinds of people. Babies get baby bottle teeth. Starts kind of mild, usually front teeth. This is mild. And then it turns more moderate, affecting more of the teeth. And then this is severe. These teeth are almost gone at that point. Uh, baby teeth are really important to keep in place because they guide the adult teeth to where they need to go. It can mess up the alignment of a child's teeth if we start pulling those teeth too soon or letting them go too soon. They do have a purpose. They're not just there in place until the other one comes. It leads the other one into the right place. Uh, they're on the crowns of the teeth. This is true for most children and adults. Root caries is true for most geriatric people. Sometimes because it's so soft, I've seen these turn into root canals or the teeth are lost a lot of times. And then there's recurrent decay that happens under previous work. Sometimes we think that decay always starts from the outside of the tooth. It doesn't always start from the outside of the tooth. Under crowns, under fillings, these things could blow up quickly and sometimes could only be seen in an x-ray. And we're moving on to these images. So I don't know how well you could see this one over here. But the reason why I picked this picture here is because it looks very similar to, I wish I had my laser pointer with me. Um, it looks very similar to what you're going to actually see in real life most of the time. 
And you could come up here more if you want, but I'm just going to kind of point with these scissors. So right here, it's going to look like these little triangles starting where the teeth are touching. So this is what you're going to want to do. Uh, you're going to take some x-rays. You're going to want to give the x-rays to the dentist, but before you give the x-rays to the doctor, you're going to want to kind of look right here in between where the teeth are touching. And if you could see these little shadows that look like little triangles with the point coming in, then especially if you see it going in past the enamel, it's pretty big. Uh, we have a couple here. We have a couple here. If you just want to look there, then you want to point those out to the dentist. Your dentist will love you. They'll be like, oh, yes, I see this here. They'll probably see a lot more than you see, but if you could start training your eye. Sometimes it's hard to train the eye to see these things. It takes sometimes years of practice to be able to see uh, sometimes what comes very easily to people who have many years of experience. Oh, wait, hold on. Go back one more time. I was just going to point out in this picture here, if you look, we have different types of the classes, uh, fillings that need to be done. This will be a class five here. This is a class three here. If you look into this picture, they have this here because this is a canine, so this decay here is going to be a class three, but if there's decay on this tooth right here, that will be a class two because it's a posterior versus an anterior. And then this tooth right here, it looks like it's going to be a class three, but for the dentist to actually make this filling good and look good, they're probably going to lose this structure right here, which will make it into a class four. Yeah. Class four restoration coming up for this person hopefully soon. That looks like the worst one. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, dental decay is infectious. It is transferable. It can be transferred from parents to child. A lot of times parents uh, share cups or they chew their food in their mouth and they give it to their baby after they chew it up for them, trying to help them. Yeah. But at the same time, it's transferring the bacteria and it could possibly, if the parent carries the bacteria, uh, put the child at risk for dental decay and future problems. This is Jessica Alba over here. She has baby's pacifier in her mouth, and then later she puts baby's pacifier in baby's mouth. <laughs> it's not even as gross as, uh, I don't know if you know who Alicia Silverstone is or the pictures. Have you seen the pictures of her where she had baby eating out of her mouth? Eating out of her mouth? One of the grossest things I've ever seen. I'm sorry. And she's such a beautiful woman. Okay, go ahead and let's look at Prevention methods. So the number one thing that dentists usually give is fluoride. Sometimes they'll just apply it in the office with a varnish. Fluoride works best on smooth surfaces. So what's good if you could do before you paint some fluoride on is to try to take like a two by two some uh, gauze and wipe off the saliva because the saliva also will kind of uh, push away where you want that especially if it's a fluoride varnish, to kind of stick at. If you have someone with recession, it's good to put those on there. So how the fluoride is working is that it will actually weaken some of the bacteria in the mouth, so they won't be able to wreak as much havoc. But it will also make these areas that are small, carious lesions back into the equivalent of hydroxyapatite, which is enamel. So in chemistry, the new structure is not going to be considered hydroxyapatite. It's going to be called floral appetite, but they're equal to each other. So sometimes the fluoride has the ability to make the area that's weak strong as it was originally. Okay, so um, there's different ways we could get fluoride. In Seattle, we have our water supply fluoridated. Uh, we could also enhance uh, our water with fluoride supplements if we choose to. You could drop like little pills in if you live in an area where your water is not already fluoridated. Um, I think some areas surrounding Seattle are not fluoridated. It's interesting, Illinois is the most fluoridated state in the United States. They're 95% fluoridated, but Washington State, like if you go to Redmond, I think Redmond's fluoridated, but Duval's just outside of Redmond, and I think that is not fluoridated. So sometimes it's good to know where your patients are living so you can help them if they're having weak teeth by getting them fluoride supplements or a toothpaste with fluoride or a mouthwash like ACT, like an ACT restoring. And sometimes they even process food with fluoridated water. Always we could get fluoride. And there's other things that can make our teeth strong too or help to reduce cavities. Uh, we could brush. We could floss. Some people hate floss. Most people hate floss. 
<laughs> I wish they all love floss. When I get a flosser, I love it. <laughs> but that is why I try to get people to use interproximal tools. Sometimes they won't use floss, but they'll use soft picks. Or they'll use toothpicks. Uh, some wooden toothpicks aren't good for the gingiva, though, because they could change the shape. But then um, there's different ways we could get fluoride, which we went over. But then there's also xylitol products. So that's those mints that we handed out. Pretty good. The mints that I handed out, they're from Starbucks. And those are the only mints that I know to just go buy without having to order them online. But you could order them online as 100% xylitol mints. Those are really best. Xyli melts are a product you could find at Rite Aid. They kind of stick up here. I've tried those. I don't really like them too much, but they're also 100%. You could get xylitol and rinses. I went to the dollar store. I found some close-up mouth rinse. has xylitol in it. <laughs> but what I always tell people, if they want to use a gum, to look at the ingredients list. So all Orbit has xylitol. That's an easy one. Uh, icebreakers. The first ingredient in icebreakers is xylitol. So if you're looking on an ingredients list and you see xylitol on there, but it's like further than three or four down in the line from the first ingredient, it's probably not enough xylitol to really make a difference. And sometimes there's other sugars in there. So you want to be careful what you give to kids. They now make a special Orbit for kids. But you could also get it as an additive sweetener from like PCC or Whole Foods. And at first, I didn't know. I was like telling patients, oh, yeah, you could, you could put it on stuff like you would put sugar on. Because it's a type of sugar. It tastes like sugar. It's a sweetener. But when the bacteria are full on xylitol, they can't metabolize anything. So remember when we were talking about the waste products, the acidic byproducts, how the bath, they're going to the bathroom in your mouth? Well, they can't do that. It stops their metabolism when they're full on xylitol. So it reduces the risk. It's really recommended for kids, but it's good for adults too. Because not only does it reduce the risk for dental decay or caries, it reduces the amount of buildup that goes onto the teeth. So even me, like end of the day, I'll take my tongue, I'll feel the back of my teeth, and sometimes it'll feel like a little fuzzy and I'll get a piece of gum, and then I'll feel the back of my teeth and it feels smoother. Like, it works like that for me, you know? So I feel a difference. But if you get the additive sweetener, tell your patients, do not put it in hot beverages. If you put it in hot beverages, it tends to have a laxative effect. So some people think, oh, great, I'll put the sweetener in my coffee, or I'll put it in my tea. <laughs> Don't do that. Warn them about that one. A laxative effect. A laxative effect makes somebody want to go to the number two. <laughs> <laughs> to the bathroom. Yeah, so you tell them no hot beverages if they want to use it as like a sweetener. It's really a sugar alcohol. Uh, the OL on the end of xylitol represents alcohol in chemistry. But it's a type of sugar. So it tastes sweet, but it's the only one we know that has dental benefits. So it's something good for people. And it's something easy for them to add in on a daily basis. Did those mints taste good to you? Yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't actually. It's kind of strong. But a little strong, yeah. yeah. In the beam, but like when you were done with these, like, it makes it like and good. Fresher. Yeah, fresh. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I like that. And then in the end, uh, the action is like, it's much. They match. Yeah. So they are really strong, though. Did anybody else think that they're overly strong? <laughs> okay, I kind of thought that too a little bit. They are a little strong, huh? <laughs> okay, the ones from 3M, I got a guy from 3M. If you tell anybody you're in dental and you want to give samples to patients, sometimes they'll give you like a big bottle of samples of mints, which is how I got one one time, but all my dental assistants ate them. All the time they walk by and they go, oh, mints. <laughs> but, um, yeah, sometimes they'll give you free samples, and the Theramints by 3M, they're a lot different than those ones. Those ones are kind of like hard. The ones by Theramints, they're kind of bigger, and they're softer, and they dissolve easier, and they're also 100%. So sometimes it is better to actually go online or go to somebody who sells dental stuff and talk to them. Okay, go ahead and switch over, which as dental assistants, you guys sometimes will have charge of inventory and ordering. So, you know, these things aren't bad to have to give out to people. I worked at an office. They would give out the little packets, like sugar packets, but it was xylitol of the additive sweetener. They would throw those in bags for people. And then ways to prevent caries. So we talked about fluoride, brushing, taking care of ourselves. We want to keep 
a moist mouth because saliva is a natural protectant. So if someone says, oh, I have a lot of saliva, sometimes it's hard to work on those people. But you know what? At the same time, it's really good for them. <laughs> and then um, I don't know if you've heard of Closis. It's also a brand, but they make a mouth spray. It's, I've tried it before. It's really good. Um, it's a really nice one for people. Sometimes people complain that they don't like certain products or they don't want to try a product because of a certain brand. But sometimes it's good just to try to switch brands or products. They're not all the same. And while we're talking about that, so sometimes people will come in. Um, they will complain of sensitivity. Doctor will recommend sensitive toothpaste. It's been my personal experience that a lot of people, a lot of dentists love to recommend Sensodyne. And a lot of patients I've noticed will sometimes have it work really good for them at first. It'll be really effective for them. And then that effect will start to taper off. And then they'll start to get sensitive teeth again. If you get a patient like this, I recommend switching brands. Because like a Sensodyne is based off of potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate is more like what's in um, potassium, bananas, that sort of thing. But it's been my, and I've had problems with sensitive teeth. It's been my personal experience, too. When I switched to a sensitive toothpaste that was more uh, with the key ingredient that was more of a calcium phosphate, I had more success with stopping my sensitivity. I was a grinder, and I've ground through dentin. This is dentin, exposed dentin. It's clean. Those are those cavities without decay. <laughs> little holes on my teeth. It hurts me sometimes. But if I take, it's called Colgate Pro Relief. The key ingredient is um, calcium phosphate. If I take just a little smear and I rub it on that tooth that's sensitive, like sweet, will bother it a lot, it goes away in a couple minutes for me. The calcium phosphate actually sometimes will react better and faster for people than people who are using a potassium nitrate. The potassium nitrate takes four to six weeks to build up before they start feeling results. But like the Colgate Pro Relief, it's called Relief for a reason. Some people, it works immediately, immediately. But other people, it takes like two weeks to build up. But it's still less than four to six weeks. So we could also get sealants. We want to place these on six-year molars. So you get a six-year-old, seven-year-old. You want to make sure that their teeth are fully erected um, before you start polishing them. That's important. But also. If they don't have sealants on those six-year molars, we want to try to get those on there. It is important because most of the time, adults will have problems with what we call number 30 or number 19. They are first molars on the mandibular teeth. Lots and lots of times I've seen adults lose these teeth, and then the two teeth or the one tooth behind it, they'll start drifting forward. And it just changes the structure of their mouth. To me, I feel the structure of the mouth is very important, so I don't like people to lose teeth. And we just stop it ahead of time with sealants. Six year is very important, but 12 year are also important. So those will be their second molars. They'll come in about that time. And we'll want to, oh yeah, so we already kind of talked about this, about if a patient's complaining of sensitivity, they don't have any decay. They don't have any signs um, that there's any watches even for them. Then sometimes um, it could just simply be switching to a sensitive toothpaste or stopping using a whitening toothpaste. Whitening products can make the teeth more sensitive. When we dry the enamel, the enamel looks white. Over time, though, the enamel doesn't like to be dry. It is a wet environment in the mouth. So whitening toothpaste will dry the mouth. Sometimes for some people, this can cause sensitivity for them. If you have a patient, I had a patient, she was actually the receptionist at the office with uh, the Russian, she was the Spanish translator. Very sweet. She would brush her teeth maybe three to four times a day. She loved to have a clean mouth. No cavities, no sign of cavities, gorgeous teeth. A lot of pain. Sensitive, all the time. I got her to stop using whitening toothpaste and start using something more uh, healthier for the enamel. Something where you go, like a Sensodyne makes something called pro -namel. Anything you see that says enamel repair, enamel protect, those are good toothpaste for your patient. So if you have someone's sensitivity, get them to try to switch the toothpaste. Avoid the whitening. Tell them if they do use whitening, because there is whitening toothpaste everywhere, and sometimes they won't see that it's whitening until after they use it. Just rinse the mouth a lot, and that will help. And let's see, there are some barriers to people that prevent them from getting uh, healthy dentally. And one of them is just receiving care. That's why we gave you that list. 
so you can share those with people. So no matter where they're at, you just go on that list. It should be alphabetized, and you can get them the information that they need. And, oh yes, another thing. If they have recession, sometimes sensitivity, they'll complain of sweet sensitivity. You could get the Sensi Stop strips to help with that. That lasts for about a month. But I think we've pretty much gone over everything. Is there any questions? Oh, if you don't brush at all? <laughs> no, it's not going to replace not brushing. It's not going to replace flossing. But what it does do is, let's say, I think it's best for people to brush and floss after every meal. That's not realistic Actually, for most people. I, I, I have a question. Like, how oh. Like, uh, would that help you, like, is it just refreshing or that, uh, does it kill, like, the bacteria? No, it's actually helping the bacteria to stop their metabolism. Oh. So then that way they're not um, creating those acidic byproducts. Oh, okay. Because if they could stop creating the acidic byproducts, mm -hmm. then it leaves the enamel to not be susceptible. Oh, okay. So it just sort of um, helps with the risk. But there's still other things that can act against that. So if somebody's not brushing and they're leaving all that food in there, but they think the xylitol is going to completely help that, it's not. <laughs> yeah. When should we say that this like to help the us like? Basically, the best time is anytime you want or after meals. After meals. Yeah. But if you want to use xylitol products like just periodically throughout the day, that's fine for you. I actually love to use them in the morning, like a gum or a mint in the morning. Yeah, it, it makes me happy. <laughs> I like them. I'm usually buying xylitol gum all the time. I throw it everywhere, and then I hand it to everybody. I do. I'm always handing this stuff out to people because I feel like it's something good for them. It's not going to hurt them, and they like it. And if they want it, why not give it to them, huh? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, some people, though, they'll tell you they don't want xylitol because it's a sugar. And people are really adamant, especially people who chew extra. They love their extra because it's sugar-free, and they don't want to switch to, like, switching to a xylitol gum. And some people hate fluoride, and they believe that it's toxic. I worked on Vashon before. <laughs> You don't want to bring that word up over there. <laughs> People over there also don't believe in vaccinations. But I think vaccinations are a good thing. Okay, so you guys ready to do a post-test? <laughs>